it's Monday night. <laughs> and I'd love to introduce the crew to you. First off, from Columbus, Ohio, we have Mr. Donald Culp. Hello, everybody. And then down to Nashville with Mr. John Tudor. Yes, this is where we're tearing down highways and not building up new ones. <laughs> Don't tear too many of them up. I gotta come through there next at the end of the month. And then we have Michael and Dana from oh, down yeah. in Houston. God bless. I like this lighting better, Mike. You can see Dan, or I like that you can see Dana. Yeah, me too. She's a lot better to look at than me. Yeah. <laughs> and finally from Brooklyn, it's me with the bullets whizzing around, sitting at traffic lights and all kinds of craziness. <laughs> So, uh, John, would you like to open us up with a word of prayer? Sure. Well, we come before you, Father. Some of us may be tired. Some of us may not be. Some of us may have problems. Some of us may not. But we're just thankful that your throne is always open to wherever we are in our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that we can just be ourselves before you. Just be naked as they say and uh, you're always there loving us and and telling us how much uh we mean and how much you how much you mean how much you, you <clears throat> how much we mean to you and how much our value just how wonderful it is to be able to be appreciated about especially by you father so I'm just here stumbling over words trying to say how thankful I am to be here with a group of people who uh, are like-minded, believe the same thing, know how good you are, that you're not a bad God, that you're a good God, and that badness comes from elsewhere. So thank you that I've learned that and know that and, and can appreciate more and more the stupidness sometimes that I've have thought about and you still love me so thank you for this fellowship and the word that's going to be taught and for your great love to all of us in christ jesus name amen amen so too many people who are out there who accuse us of having a blind faith and yet if you look at what they believe it's unbelievable it's unbelievable. That's a good way to put it, John. <laughs> That's an excellent way to put it. I, I gotta find your blog. <sighs> I mean, I know there's three in one oil, but I don't believe in the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Be that as it may, I am taking the hef the longer teaching tonight. So, Mr. Michaels. Uh, Putting it up. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael. I'm glad you do this for me. Yes, sir. Before we start chapter eight, we need to review a bit about chapter seven. And let me tell you about that anytime you're reading in the Bible, if you're starting in the middle of something, you've got to go back to the beginning so you get it in context, so you can see what God is trying to tell us. That should be done. Every, that's one of the biggest keys in interpreting the Bible, is keeping things in context. I mean, if I can go into Job and show you things that if you don't start from the beginning and understand what happened via how much Job knew that was available for Job to know. Like the, Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Guess what? It ain't the truth. God never took anything away from anybody. Well, Job's, I don't care if Job said it. The word doesn't say it's true. So you always have to remember when somebody's speaking, you have to take into consideration when they're speaking, what they're saying about the situation. You know, they're just, I'm getting off on a tangent here. That's not my purpose for tonight. I'm trying to keep it short. <laughs> All right. So in any case, before we start eight, we need to review a little bit about uh, Hebrews seven. 
<laughs> so in Hebrews 7 1, it says, This Melchizedek was king of Salem and a priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave a tenth of everything. First, first the name Melchizedek. Okay, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. This should be a new paragraph here. Sorry about that. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then it, the king of Salem means king of peace. Now, who else can you think of in the Bible who might be called the king of righteousness and the king of peace? Why, it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. These two titles apply to him in a perfect sense. In a figurative sense, they apply to Melchizedek. This makes him a Christ-like figure. Verse 3, without father or mother or genealogy, without beginning of days or end, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now, Jesus had parents and a genealogy. In fact, you can trace it through the word. That's one of the most important things to remember. You can trace Jesus Christ all the way from Adam to him, <coughs> which proves he's a man. But it's through his mother's line, not his father's line, that you can prove that he's a, he's a man. Because Joseph is not the Joseph was not the physical father of Jesus Christ. God was. No matter what these people that Michael was talking about say, you know, that's what the word says. Okay, verse 6. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had promised, and without a doubt the lesser blessed the greater. The lesser being Mel, and the greater being Abraham. Uh, he didn't, this man, Jesus Christ, however, did not trace his descent, or uh, Mel, good old Mel, did not trace his descendant from Levi. He, you know why? Levi hadn't been born yet. Levi was about two or three hundred years, or a hundred and some odd years later after this incident. <coughs> this, this incident that it's talking about here goes all the way back to around Genesis, what, 12 or 13, someplace around there. I should have looked that up. The lesser being Mel and the greater being Abraham, right? Because Abraham had the promise. Mel was a great guy, I mean, king and all, and high priest of God, but he still was the lesser compared to Abraham, because Abraham had the promise. And what he said is even more clear. If another priest like Mel appears, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of power and indestructible life, where he declared, you are a priest forever, you are in the order of Mel. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. Remember that. That verse right there just called the whole law weak and useless. People lived under that for 2,000, what, 2,000 years approximately, something like that, 1,500 years of 2,000. They were under the law, and the law was useless. It did We'll get to that. For the law made nothing perfect. A better hope is introduced by which God, by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath. God said to him, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So Jesus Christ has been made our high priest forever. He's our brother, that's true, but he's also our high priest. 
because uh, he's high priest to Israel too. I mean, he's the head of the body for us. For Israel, he's the high priest. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. I don't normally go over this much of a previous chapter, but I need you to know this information to understand what is to be discussed in chapter 8. So let's do it. Let's get into Hebrews 8. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by mere human beings. You need to go over the instructions given to Moses going back to Exodus 33 to read about the tent. This also became part of the temple when it was built in Jerusalem. <coughs> now, the, you have to understand uh, the, the temple. Mike, do you have that picture of the temple? In any case, you have to understand the temple had three sections. Each of them had a doorway. The outer court, which is where everybody gathered. Then there was an inner court. And that's where the, the priests did, uh, I believe, all the, the work, they, the ministerial work they did, like doing the sacrifices. They did all the sacrifices of the, the lambs, the goats, the birds, all of it in this section. And that's also where they uh, did the burning. Now, it's interesting. Do you know that they sometimes gave the sacrifice after it had been sacrificed back to the people who gave it to them so that they could take it home and eat it for dinner? Interesting thing I didn't know till I got into some research on that. All right, in any case, and then there was a third section called the Holy of Holies. And the only person who went into that section was the high priest once a year with a rope tied around his waist in case he died. They could pull him out because otherwise nobody could go in there for a year to get him. And if they died, boy, it would start to stink it. But <laughs> And it's interesting, too, that room was lit only by the glory of God. And do I believe that? Yeah, I have every trust in that promise that that room was lit by the glory of God. All right, let's move along. Otherwise, I'll get off on a tangent again. From the commentary in the Rev, the holy places, the Greek is ton hagion, mortuary of the holy. Uh, neutral, plural, and if you want that explained, give Mike Platt to do it because I'm not good with the uh, Greek grammar, <laughs> which can refer to holy places or holy things. However, F.S. Bruce points out in Hebrews, the neutral plural regularly refers to holy places or as a whole, the heaven, heavenly tabernacle or temple. The New International Commentary on New Testament, the Epistle of Hebrews, Hebrews. If Jesus is the high priest ministering to the holy places, then he is also attending to the holy things. True tabernacle. Hebrews 7 shows a weakness in the uh, priest, Aaron priesthood, and how much better Jesus Christ was as the new high priest. Hebrews 8 um, continues. Oh, sorry, I heard a noise in the background. I was distracted. Uh, Hebrews 8 continues that theme and shows that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and now ministers as the high priest, not in an earthly tabernacle. The Greek word is actually tent. We get the word, we get tabernacle from the context and the scope. But in the tabernacle in heaven, there is some evidence that God has has a tabernacle or more likely a temple in heaven in case it is impossible uh, because it is quite possible that the earth earthly tent meeting tabernacle set up by Moses was sort of a copy similar to the one 
in heaven. So God gave Moses a pattern on how the, the earthly tent of meeting was to look. And you can see that in all these verses. It's really interesting. The, uh, most people don't realize that at night they'd set up a tent just to put the Ark of the Covenant in, a special tent. And that went on for years and years and years, all the way till Solomon finally got the temple built. And then they had a room to put the Ark of the Covenant into. The old is replaced in the in new in Jesus Christ. The old tent of meeting and the temple of earth are replaced by the heavenly ones. The Aaronic high priests are replaced by Jesus Christ, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the old animal sacrifices are replaced by the blood of Christ. You know, there's a verse in Galatians that it says, if you are a debtor to do any of the law, you are a debtor to do the whole law. So those who want to teach were still under the law better start sacrificing animals because that's what the law required. Either Jesus Christ changed things or he didn't. You can't have it both ways. He changed things. And there are new rules. For instance, you can't show me the word, show me where they were uh, told to celebrate the Sabbath from Romans till you get to Revelation. In Revelation, they start celebrating the Sabbath again because they go back to the Abrahamic law during that period. Okay, the old is replaced by the new. Okay, I read that. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this reason to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there, there are already priests who offered gifts prescribed by law. From the word, from uh, the Rev commentary again. Uh, if you want explanations for this Greek stuff, talk to Mike. I'm, like I said, I'm no good with Greek. I barely, um, oh, I forgot verse 5. <laughs> they serve at a sanctuary. This is a copy of the shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was born when, they, he, when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown in the mountain. So the tent thing, Moses got that all the way back in, when he was fooling around on Mount Sinai, I believe. <coughs> I believe that's where he was, Mount, uh, where he got the Ten Commandments. It goes all the way back to then. So now, as I said, all this Greek stuff, if you want an explanation, write to Mike Lewis. He can explain it. I really am not very good with it. I have enough trouble with English grammar. Believe me, I am not good with grammar. Because I just talk like I feels like talking. Um, divinely born from this Greek word. The word has the common connotation of divine instruction or and or warning. The context makes it clear that the, here a warning is a stronger meaning, interestingly, in all other incidents in the word book of Hebrews. For more, for more on this word, see the commentary of Mark 12, 12, divinely instructed. Okay, see Exodus 25 for the above. That's where this original vision of the, uh, the tent was given. See to, um, see to it that you make it according to the pattern shown to you in the mountain. But in fact, verse 6, but in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received a superior to their covenant as to the covenant, which he is the mediator, is superior to the old one, 
since the new covenant is established on better promises. See, the old covenant was given back in, it started, well, it started with Genesis 3.15, but the, the actual covenant that was given to Moses was you obey the law and you get blessed. You don't obey the law, you get popped. And even that didn't hold true because God is so great, has so much grace and so much love in his heart. He should have destroyed Israel time and time again, but they did a pretty good job of that themselves. They would uh, just thumb their nose at God and go and live exactly how they felt like living. And then, you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, they, you know, the prophets, the prophets, they killed the prophets. Israel killed the prophets. Those prophets that they revered so much, such as Isaiah, it, and they, for example, they tried to kill Isaiah so many times. And God just kept delivering Isaiah. And, you know, God can keep delivering people a lot. But there are just times when, you know, Israel was doing things. There was a prophecy. And it was that Nineveh would storm over if they didn't repent, would, uh, if Israel didn't repent, would come storming in and take over, take away Israel. And that's the message that um, Jonah was carrying when he went to Spain, which is the opposite direction of Nineveh. And as he, you know, got there, he got swallowed by a great fish, and then the great fish swam back to Nineveh and puked him up. Took three days. Okay, well, let me not get off on that, too, because that's, that's a whole other teaching, a beautiful teaching, in fact. And in any case, Nineveh repented, and God forgave him. And then years later, Nineveh did come storming into Israel and carried away 10 of the 12 tribes. He, verse 7, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place, no place would have been seen or sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, some manuscripts translate this, translated fault and said to the people, okay, this is just some translations, trans, how that's that uh, particular phrase is tr uh, translated. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old, the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because it did, they did not remain faithful to my covenant. I turned away from them, declares the Lord, this is covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Israel, that's a quote from the Old Testament, and Israel, even further back in the Old Testament, and Israel never fulfilled that promise. Not once did Israel fulfill that promise. They constantly were turning them. I mean, were there times? Yes, there were times of greatness in Israel. Joshua become leader. You know, the whole reason Israel was out in the desert for 40 years was because they didn't believe God. They didn't trust God. So they went wandering around in the desert for 40 years. They were about 40 days away. When that happened and for each day they were away from it they wandered and till all the people of that generation had come and gone and then it, with the exception of joshua and cable who both went into the promised land with jo with uh, joshua or yeah with joshua no longer will they try and teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least to the greatest, for 
and for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sin no more. And that's that whole thing I just read is a quote from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, many people teach that the church of the body absorbed Israel's part, and we are now in the new covenant. I don't see anything in the word that would back that idea. It says specifically that the covenant applies to Israel, not to the born-again believers. It applies to Israel. So the new covenant isn't in effect. The new covenant won't take effect till the book of Revelation. Um, it says specifically that the covenant applies to Israel. If things had changed, God would have specifically said that, and he did not. Therefore, the teaching that we are now in the new covenant is a tradition of man with no biblical basis. So that's Hebrews chapter 8. Now, I really recommend sometime you just sit down and really start looking at the book of Hebrews. The whole reason I'm doing this whole set on Hebrews is I didn't know anything about the book of Hebrews. I've start, started to get just a little bit more knowledge of Hebrews. So it's an important book. Because it tells the new Christians what to expect. Now, it was directed to the, the Hebrews, the new, uh, the Hebrew Christians. It's not directed directly at us, but we can still learn an awful lot from this. And, you know, there's a lot of things that were going on at the time that you and I would not understand. But, I mean, a Hebrew would understand all of this stuff without any problem because he he was this was based on their lives and how they lived so i really suggest that you sit down and take a an hour or two and at least read the book of hebrews if you have to break it up into parts fine you know there's like 13 chapters so um three three times uh, four with an extra day one, extra day on the chapter of between eight and nine because eight is so short would be a great idea. So Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that you've given us the book of Hebrews and we can understand and we can see the example. We can see the example of what it is that the, the Jews did and what it is that we need to do to correct because we don't have to live under the, we're under a different system we're not under the law we're under grace and if we fall all we have to do is get up and dust ourselves off and say sorry dad I'll try harder next time to do the right thing or I will do the right thing next time so, Heavenly Father, I just thank you that we can live in a day and age where we can do that. And we don't have to go through the sacrifices and all the rest of the malarkey that the, well, not malarkey, all the, the rest of the stuff that the Jews had to go through to obtain righteousness. But it all boils back down to one thing, Father. Abraham was blessed because he had faith in you, like Mike talked about tonight. We have to have faith in you. And that's just a matter of trust. Taking your promises, applying them in our life, and going to work. And I thank you for all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.